It is um, Tuesday, March 15th, right of March. Um, it is, this is Senate Government Operations. And we have, we are here um, and Senator Ron Hinsdale is with us in spirit and kind of as an apparition up there. Is that the appropriate word? Apparition? A hologram. A hologram. Kind of talking one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And <clears throat> so um, I will. You're bigger than life. <laughs> Look at she's yeah, bigger three, than life. You are. You're about three times the size you are when you're in the committee because you're in the full screen. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with um, H628, which is an act relating to amending a birth certificate to reflect gender identity. And <clears throat> we have Tucker who is going to do a walkthrough of the bill itself, but I'd like to um, defer to uh, Representative Taylor Small, who is both the reporter and the sponsor of the bill and to, to give us some context and why this is important. So I don't know that, I'm Jeanette White. I don't know if you know all of us, but I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County, Wyndham District. I know you. <laughs> yeah, who are you? We, Brian Gallimore from the Rutland District. <laughs> Allison Clark from the Windsor District. Okay, great. Thank you. And Gail, you know Gail. Right. Great. And that's Senator Ron Hinsdale up there from Chittenden, who I'm sure you know <laughs> since you're from Chittenden. A prize man. So, this is the book I first but really got to know Taylor at the wedding. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, there you are. Okay. So do you want to uh, give us some context for this? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me here today. Mm -hmm. Representative Taylor Small for the record. Um, H628 actually came from a constituent request. Um, a resident of Vermont who moved to Oregon um, and was looking to amend their passport to have a gender X marker. And in the process, they realized that they actually need to amend their birth certificate to have a, a same gender marker on there to be able to move through the federal process. Mm. But when the request was made to the Department of Health, they said, we actually don't have rules in place to be able to do this. And then when they started to do the rulemaking process on adding a gender X marker, they realized that if they added a gender X marker through rules, that it would create this inequity in the system where if someone had a binary transition of M to F, male to female, or female to male on a birth certificate, it's a more cumbersome process with um, proving um, medical interventions and having letters and going before the court to be able to uh, have that change be made, along, of course, with a fee that comes along with that. But that it would be a simple attestation process for a gender X marker. So in collaboration with uh, the legislature, not legislative council, legal advisor uh, for the Department of Health. We worked in um, giving that rulemaking authority to the department to be able to make sure that there weren't inequities in the system and that it was the same process to move to a gender X marker as it would be for a binary transition as well. So when you look at the bill itself, um, as you all know very well, our legislative intent and purpose is really important when it comes to the rulemaking process. And so looking at making this a simple and equitable system um, through means of self-attestation is the main piece in the first part. The other pieces I'll uh, bring your attention to are one, uh, recognizing that uh, the rulemaking process that we're looking to have in place is that simple attestation process with consideration for a third gender X marker. We're not limiting the department by any means, but making a specific ask that there are at least three gender markers that are available for birth certificates. Um, and also we give them the opportunity to add gender pronouns. Um, it's not something that we are asking the department to do, but are giving them the leeway to do so if they see it as important. The other piece I'll address is the emergency rulemaking authority, really recognizing that once the statute is removed, there will be no processes in place for someone to be able to amend their birth certificate. So we granted emergency rulemaking authority so that they're able to put these new rules in place for the simple attestation process. But as a reminder, in the background, as the emergency rules are in place, the full rulemaking process is still happening and will happen with both public participation and consideration from LCAR. Again, 
the legislative committee uh, administrative rules. Um, and really the, the hope here is making it easier for trans and non-binary folks here in the state of Vermont to be able to amend their birth certificate. I think a really powerful piece of testimony that we received was one from the Department of Health recognizing that when we made the change for driver's licenses to be able to have a, a simple process to use a gender X marker, we now have about 2,000 Vermonters who have now made the switch on their driver's license without an, any kind of outreach campaign. Sorry, about 2,000 Vermonters have uh, moved to a gender X marker on their license. And the other piece was hearing from uh, youth from Outright Vermont who really said that identity validation is life-saving and being able to have their identity validated on vital records um, meant uh, um, the world to them to have it in place. And that is really my testimony on H628 and I'm open to any questions that you may have. I I do, um, I don't know if other committee members do, but I, I hate, really do hate to show my ignorance here. But I'm going to. You know that I've done that in the past, haven't, haven't I? Um, no. <laughs> yes, Taylor was part of, uh, was with me when I did that. Um, but anyway. We're right for every day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the three identities, it would be MFX. Is, yeah. that, is that what it would be? So anybody who doesn't want to identify as either male or female would identify as X, but people would have the choice of any of the three, how they did that. That is correct. And consistent with, again, what we've done with driver's licenses here in the state of Vermont, as well as um, we are not the only state to put such a, a marker in place. So we'd be joining about, I believe, I can fact check myself afterwards, about 24, well, 23 states and DC that have moved to a gender X marker as that non-binary option. So X doesn't stand for anything except I don't want to be identified as male or female. That is correct. Okay. All right. I I just um, don't want to be stupid here, but I do want to understand. That's you're never question. you're never stupid. That is a good question. And I I mean yes. So I think this is great, but I'm going to put on my genealogist hat and my hist history and my date longitudinal study hat. All those hats. History, longitudinal studies, um, accuracy in data. This amends, it doesn't change the original birth of a person for tracking over time and for research and for genealogy. I mean, this doesn't change, this doesn't, um, so tell me what this actually does to a birth certificate because I will, I have to be honest, I will have, I have a, I'm, I'm curious and a little challenged by the idea that you would actually change the sex you were born. I, because I think that's important historically and from a data point of view to keep collecting. Now that is a great question for the Department of Health. But to my knowledge, it is an amended birth certificate, but would be the only one accessible to the public um, without an amendment addition on there. The person themselves and their family members would be able to access the prior unamended birth certificate, but for the general public, as we included here in the bill, um, would not fall under the public records act. Okay, great. So that amended does not mean the original document, and I think Tucker has an answer over there. I'm seeing him chomping at the back. Um, because that that is really a, a, a major concern. So I'm, I'm happy to talk I'm about happy that. to switch seats if you would like to add, uh, answer from legislative council. Well, let's see if there are other questions. Okay. Well, I guess it's along the same lines, we we're talking about changing to an first symptom, say M, F, or X. Mm -hmm. Is there never a possibility that somebody might want to change from F to M or M to F? I mean, well, yes. And so that was the reason why we did this process instead of just allowing rulemaking to add the gender X marker. It's making it a, a simplified self attestation process for any of those um, transitions. So M to F, M to X, F to M, F to X, etc. So I don't really understand. I mean, I understand rulemaking, but 
talk a little bit more about what you just said about how you're making the process simpler now instead of going to all the rule making first, that kind of thing. You know, that's a valid question I'm asking. What makes good sense? So the statute that is being removed currently um, allows for that binary transition of M to F and F to M. Um, and so what we are doing is in allowing that addition of the gender X marker, we are also making it a simpler process for that transition from male to female or female to male on the birth certificate. Because right now it's a, a cumbersome process that involves um, medical documents, it involves going to the courts and paying a court fee, um, as well as that additional letter from a psychologist, I believe. And this would take what, just my saying I want to do it? Um, that would be determined in the rulemaking process, but okay. yes. So we don't we don't actually have the rules yet for how it would be implemented, and that would be that is part of the expedited rulemaking process. Correct, which involves public um, comment as well. Okay. Any more questions? For so I'm just curious, the other states that have done this, I assume several other states have done this. Where are we sort of in that trajectory of? of I will double check these numbers, but I believe it is about 13 other states that have moved to a process that allows for a simple attestation process for gender marker changes. When the, the Board of Eagle Department did it, did they go through a process? I mean, I, I didn't know they did that. I'm just not aware of that. I mean, was there a process that go through that happened? They did that through rules. Yeah, and they did it a while. They did do it a while ago, they, yes. They did it a while ago. So we, we did this. Um, a few years ago, as I remember, but what we must have done was just the ability to change from M to F or F to M, right? We didn't have that third option on there and it was cumbersome. We, we, I mean, we, cause I remember addressing this issue, but we didn't address it fully at that time. And our we understanding did, but, of gender has right. really changed a right. lot, I would say even in the past 10 years. Right, and so I think we thought we were doing what we needed to do, but as right. it turned out, we weren't. Well, we, but we, I mean, we did what we needed to at that time, but now, yeah, you're right. Yes. So, Ram Hensil, do you have any questions? Um, well, I just didn't know if uh, if Representative Small was going to stay through Tucker's um, more formal walkthrough, but I just want to thank Representative Small for bringing this forward, and I feel like it's a change we could make quickly, and I just look forward to passing the bill. I think that that is up to you, Taylor, whether you want to stay or <clears throat> I don't know what committee, I can't remember what committee you're on, but you're on. Yeah. Human services. Do you um, want to jump on there or do you want to go back? I would be happy to stay through Tucker's walkthrough. Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And, and I just want to stay through Tucker's walkthrough. It is. <laughs> I, and I just want to say this, uh, you know, Je uh, Jeanette referred to this earlier, but I'm so pr proud because Chris has been bringing up this issue, Chris Bray, for a long time in the Senate. So I'm really proud of, you know, that, that we do have a senator who's been bring, working on this for a long time. And yeah. we've worked, touched on it, but we haven't. It's great the House acted first. Yes. Well, we um, backed off. I don't remember what yeah. number it was here, but I did tell um, 273. There it is right up there. It's 273. And he got it in right in the nick of time. And I, and then I said, we're gonna just, we'll take the bill when it comes from the house. So thank you. Thank you. Better. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good Tucker afternoon. Oh, you were someplace warm and sunny. Uh, yes. Massachusetts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, uh, well. You know, I, uh, my, my skin tone changed from here to here because I was, I spent a, a long time running with a buff and a hat. <coughs> so I'm just, I'm sun worn on my forehead. Okay, okay. Uh, well, you have, you have in front of you age 628, Representative Small did an absolutely excellent job of uh, giving you the high level overview. There's not going to be a lot of mechanics that we'll have to work through as part of the walkthrough. 
uh, some brief background in history here. Under the current statutory process, uh, a person may petition the probate court uh, to change the sex that is reported on their birth certificate. The work that this committee and the House Government Operations Committee did three or four years ago on the vital record system was uh, to add some uh, uh, avenues for changing sex on a birth certificate and to change the requirement that a birth certificate be stamped as amended when those changes right. were made. Another change that came as a result of the updates to the vital record system uh, was to alter access to these records. And that gets to some of the questions that Senator Clarkson brought up. Uh, at the time, any person in the world could request an official copy of a Vermonter's birth certificate and could then just have a verified copy of Tucker Anderson's birth certificate, if I was born in Vermont, um, and use it for whatever purposes they wanted. That changed. And the statewide registration system now keeps the verified birth, death, and other vital statistics within a statewide registry. And agents, which are predominantly your town clerks, can then provide either certified or non-certified copies of a birth certificate. Um, there is no more marking a birth certificate as amended. And at the time, town clerks were instructed that any time a birth certificate was changed, uh, that the original certificate was to be destroyed. That was something that was put in uh, four years ago. So there would still be an official central version of whatever the vital certificate was, uh, but the original version, the unamended version, would be destroyed. That was pulled out last year because the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association flagged that as a serious concern on their part for knowing when they were destroying the right record or when they were supposed to be discarding a record that was kept in physical form that they didn't know if it was duplicated in a chain of custody within the state registry. Uh, the answer to Senator Clarkson's question is that when the record within the registry is changed, that is the record that's going to be available for searches moving forward. So once the amendment is entered into the system, that is the official record that can be requested by members of the public, by the individual, by their family, and now by public agencies, which is another uh, amendment that was added last year to the vital record system. So it's going to be the amended version that replaces that original version. That is going to be the official document that is available to everyone. Uh, you may want to check with David Englander uh, to see whether the statewide registry keeps archived information about the changes that have been made to a particular particular vital record. But the official copy that will be available for genealogical and historical searches and for official government purposes will be the amended certificate. Yeah. So that's useless for somebody who's studying gender changes, uh, how many people in a population actually choose to change their sex. Uh, I mean, I think this is, I think somewhere we have to be keeping an original birth certificate. Yeah. Even, even if you amend it. I mean, I understand amending it. I think this is great. But I also, from a, from a research point of view and from a, uh, I think it's essential that an original be kept and, you know, you can have limited access to it, but there has to be some way for research to continue. Um, I thought he said they are kept now that we were. No, I, I, no. Oh, I thought you not. said we removed them. No, this is a problem, I think. <laughs> Unless, okay. and to be clear, moving forward, the issue that you dealt with with the clerks where they were destroying the older records, that was typically where there was a physical certificate kept in the indices of the individual town clerk, right? I'm not certain how much that happens now that there is a uh, electronic based central repository where the information is kept. I'm not sure how many clerks out there are going into the system each time there's a new certificate recorded in their municipality and printing out a copy, a static copy of that electronic record 
on X date and filing it away in the archive. Um, I would suggest that you get some testimony from the department about what yeah. chain of custody. Is, is uh, it David and right. Tanya? Did we have to get both? Oh. It was, it, it is David. This yeah. is the Department of Health. Uh, VSARA does have some archival records going back, but those have also been transitioned into the statewide registration system. I, I, I just think this is important. I mean, for research for, I mean, just think of health issues. I mean, because when you ch change, you know, when you have a gender transformation there, there's just tons of things I can imagine. My imagination runs wild thinking of the research that people might do. And I'm, if part of this was prompted by an article in the last week about the number of, of um, uh, LBGTQ families that we have here in Vermont and marriages and, uh, you know, that we're tracking this kind of data and, and, and talking about it and writing about it. it the same research might want to be done on how many people in this state or anywhere in the United States transition it has that grown. I mean, we haven't collected data on that in the past. It's great to collect, you know, to be able to amend your birth certificate, but to alter history is, is, is I think, another issue. And I think that's, uh, I have concerns with that as a you know, person who loves history and as a person who loves research and being able to write about what, how this might be the one one very friendly state to, to transition in. So, so I anyway. just need to ask a question to, in my own mind. Sorry, I thought you said that <clears throat> there is a birth certificate. The original birth certificate is there. It says the, the gender that you were born with, it was determined when you were born, that that's there. You can amend the, the birth certificate. It doesn't get stamped amended anymore, but now you could change it to M, F, or X from whatever it was. But that this original birth certificate still remains there and is available to the person, to their family, and I don't know to who else, but I thought you said Maybe either you or I think our representative Small said that. So that original copy yes. would exist if it was kept in physical form and it was not destroyed in that two and a half year period where the agents were instructed to destroy the original copy. Now, big breath, big pause. We're going to get into it in this bill and this is not a change from current law. Amendments to a birth certificate related to a what was formerly a change in sex and here is a change in gender are confidential. Mm. So even if that original record exists, the record that you are going to be able to request, which is the important distinction here, mm -hmm. discussing Senator Clark, Clarkson's question, we're going to be able to request a certified or non-certified copy of the birth certificate you are not going to get that original copy. Right. Right. So the only people that it impacts here are people who might be doing research because the person, the person themselves or their family, if they choose to let their family know, but the person themselves will have access to that, assuming that in this two and a half years, it wasn't destroyed. But from now on, they won't be destroyed because that was taken out last wow. year. Well, it was taken out last year, so they aren't destroying them anymore. That's what we just heard. Mm -hmm. So there was a short period of time there where they may have been. And if they were, that's unfortunate, but that's the way it happened because apparently we didn't get it written exactly right. And um, but so the researchers are the ones that won't have access to that original birth certificate. Senator Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. At what age can an individual choose to do this? That was a question that came up in the House, and the response is that it's going to depend on the rules that are adopted by the Department of Health. Uh, this is open to a person, so if you are a person, you can request this. Uh, the issue is going to be when will 
a person's capacity to make the request be a self-attestation that qualifies under the statewide registration system. What, just follow up on that. what have other states, what ages of other states, have they set ages or? That isn't research that I have done to this point, but persons. Yeah, uh, typically it is, uh, if you are under the age of 18, it is with parental consent. Um, and then over the age of 18 would be up to the individual's choice. That's how marriage happens in Vermont. That's how marriage happens. Well, no, no, I mean, that is the rule for marriage. Mm -hmm. Under 16 to 18, you have to have parental consent. 18, you can get married. Full yeah. fresh in range of spirit. Well, I, I did a lot of research on ages. Um, when you could do something in anticipation of a oh, potential, else we're going to be doing. potential override. Yes, I did a lot of. Can you just remind me what the difference is between a certified and a non certified document? The answer is paper. So uh, there's, <laughs> there's very special and expensive paper that a certified copy is printed on that has watermarks and some other sophisticated paper technology so that when it's taken to a government office for an official governmental purpose, they can see the watermark. There's a code that's embedded in it. I believe that a few years ago when you were working through the vital records changes that the Department of Health testified that each sheet of paper is some exorbitant cost. People were paying up to $10,000 a sheet for it so that they could create false identities. Yeah. Um, and they're also numbered. So the, if you have number 20,000 and then 20,001, and then nobody can attest, find 20,002, somebody's in trouble. Yes. And they're also sealed, uh, the official or certain records. Working through the bill. Okay. <laughs> section, section one of the bill means legislative intent and purpose. Uh, it states that it's the intent of the General Assembly to promote equity by allowing all individuals, regardless of their gender, to amend vital records to accurately reflect and affirm their identities. It highlights that there has been a long history of discrimination and violence against the LGBTQIA plus community, and that the bill you have in front of you is acting to mitigate future harm through the creation of a simple and equitable system that represents a small overview. Section two of the bill. Uh, first, we repeal the current process for the issuance of a new or amended birth certificate to reflect a change in sex. We discussed some of the history and the current process in place there, which as Representative Small highlighted, uh, requires the submission to the court of uh, evidence either through attestation of a physician or through documentation of medical procedures indicating uh, a change in sex. In its place, starting subsection A here, new language on page three, first state the policy preceding the section. It says that it's the policy of the state to honor and acknowledge all gender identities and to protect public health and dignity of all individuals irrespective of their gender. Accordingly, the state shall adopt a simple process by which an individual may amend the marker on a birth certificate to reflect the individual's gender identity, including a third non-binary marker. So we call out the third non-binary marker here, as Representative Small highlight is typically the gender marker X. Subsection B, uh, we have pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act, the department shall adopt rules as necessary for the purposes of implementing, administering, or enforcing the requirements of the section. So there will be a full APA rulemaking process behind this. The department may adopt rules to add gender pronouns to the list of markers on a birth certificate in order to foster a gender literate environment and reflect the individual's gender identity. So again, through this rulemaking process, they may add to the list of markers that can be used on a certificate. And the subsection D, except is otherwise required by law. And I'll pin that clause to come back to. Records relating to the amendment of a birth certificate pursuant to this chapter shall be confidential and shall be exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. 
uh, these sorts of records were already confidential under the terms of the current vital record system. This is just making sure that moving forward with this new language, they are still exempt. And there was a question in the House about that opening clause in subsection D, except as otherwise required by law. When may it be required by law that these uh, amended records would need to be produced, potentially pursuant to a court order for some reason? And there were some very astute questions in the House Human Services Committee about uh, whether original records could be procured for purposes of, for example, uh, an estate after you have someone pass away, would they be able to use this through a court process to identify a beneficiary officially for some reason? And the answer from the department was potentially yes. Yes, I mean that. But the original I mean, one, the one that they would be, that the courts would guess would, would be or in the archives. Uh, if if not the original, office. then a record from the department indicating that the amendment took place, which would be just as useful for that process. Yes, to say why they're If a will leaves money to a person who has become another, who has changed their sex, that is a big legal challenge. And that was what that would be why they would have to go and find the the original birth certificate so that they would know that that person was the same as a, a, a changed person. I mean, if I say I'm leaving this to my son, but in fact, my son has uh, changed and is now my daughter. Correct. I mean, I, I, I see that, okay. that would be an issue, particularly for families that may not know. I mean, not everybody is. Okay. Okay. I just, I yeah. didn't know why. Yeah. But for I an think, estate. Okay. Section three uh, provides the department with emergency rulemaking authority. Again, uh, your emergency rules when they're adopted are temporary. They're valid only for a brief period of time. But as was pointed out, this would be the stop gap so that there is still a procedure in place while the department goes through the full rulemaking process. The effective date of the act is July 1st, 2022. Um, may I go up to see on page four and ask the question there? I don't know what that means that the department may adopt rules to add gender pronouns. Does that mean they could add a B and a C and a D or they could add, but I, I've never seen a gender pronoun on a birth certificate. I mean, do they say he or she on birth certificates? I've never seen that. I'm actually not certain, but uh, in addition to some of the words that may be used in the form of the birth certificate, part of the intent here is to allow, dependent on, again, the rulemaking process and the input from the stakeholders, the department to implement something in addition to the X marker that okay. could be used. So it's the, the, the um, I didn't think of that as the, as a pronoun, but rather as a, uh, what do we call it? Marker. A marker. <laughs> a marker. It's something made about pronouns. I know, but it's, it, I was confused by the word pronoun there and thought maybe it should say marker instead, gender marker, since that's what we used in the other. The, but that was my only question. The final wrap up of this subject area and questions that had come up in the past. Um, there were some questions about how this squares with federal law and federal processes. Uh, the answer is that by and large, the federal government is making this change now. Um, and that there is currently no requirement when a passport is issued that the underlying birth certificate match in terms of either sex or gender marker what the person is requesting for a passport. And the State Department is undergoing rulemaking process now to add the X marker to US passports, and there have already been passports issued with an X marker. So I believe the first was pursuant to a court order. Yes. All right. Well, uh, yes. So does that cover any further changes the feds might make if there? I mean, if, if there are other changes the feds might make 
would we want to incorporate them in this? Or, right, we could do that at another date. Uh, I think there's enough room here with the department, particularly in that subsection C, to deal yeah, with any changes that may happen yeah. at the federal level. Okay, I just am here because we're doing this with the paid family leave uh, task force in economic development. We're, we're also, you know, leaving room for anticipating the feds may act on it as well, which, okay. <laughs> Any other questions for Tucker? So do we um, want to have David come in and talk to us about how they're kept and who will have access to them and how that will work? I, I'd be very interested. In that. Okay. All right. We'll have him come in and um, find out how this would work for Did David it, come and talk to you? Uh, yes, I did get correspondence from David if you would like that answer now. If you have it, we certainly could take it. I Thank do. you. Um, so the information is that the statewide registration system will keep track of the original birth certificates, but they will only be accessible to the person and the person's family. And, and or the personal case. Okay. I see. Yeah. We would assume that it's a personal case that, that they would share it themselves and, and pass it. Yeah. But it does not include, to answer your question, it does not include researchers explicitly in that right. procurement. So, but it would include the court order, right? It would, yeah. So, yes. So I, I would be curious to have David because I would be curious to ask David about other research that's done because all birth certificates are, I mean, going forward now are only accessible by individual request, right? No, I mean, they aren't available. To no, you public. can get an uncertified copy. Any, you could go in and get an uncertified copy of Tucker's. Anybody can get uncertified copies. You just oh, can't anybody. get anybody. Anybody can. And anybody, a researcher or the local dog catcher, or I'm sure probably lots of people want to have copies of my birth certificate. Well, I wasn't born in Vermont, but um, yes, anybody can get an uncertified copy. And the, the thing about, um, we just did something in judiciary about having, allowing access for um, people doing research on, um, I think it was <clears throat> um, uh, expunged records. I think that's what it was. But the problem is, is that how would you, if you opened it up to people doing research, how would you even certify or verify who is doing legitimate research? I could go in and say, I'm, I'm doing research on, on this and, and anybody could claim that they were doing research. I, I, I actually don't think that's, I, I don't think that's the case. I think there are ways to prove legitimate research and have institutions affirm who people are and what work they're doing. I guess with all of these things, all historic records, um, it, is, it is a challenge if people mm -hmm. can't access uh, aspects of history that are, I mean, it, it's just a question for me. And it's like, is it worth putting, it's like a, a copyright of a book. I mean, do we put X number of years on it, like a life expectancy, and then it's available, or, I don't know, I, I, I'm, it's a question. I, I just, yeah, Senator Ron Hinsdale. Well, I'm, I'm just with you, Madam Chair. I feel like that actually opens up bigger questions that we don't have time to answer about people accessing really sensitive information period we're, we're trying to do more and more to protect people's identities for theft reasons etc and the health department i imagine and believe and we could probably get confirmation of this though you know it's my it would be my sense because they track everything marriages divorces this information will probably end up helping them track census information when people take a census they list their preferred gender um 
So that to me seems like the critical component to research. I think it's frightening to think about somebody who's going to go look at individual birth certificates or ask the Department of Health for information about who has switched genders in some way or asked for a different gender marker. We're Vermonters. <laughs> you know, we don't really I think, want our information out there. So I think anything we do to try and give some some nod to somebody's original birth certificate doesn't seem right. And I, I guess it's problematic to me to call it history. You know, somebody is often doing this because they, they feel like they, their identity has remained the same and that the information around them identifying their gender does not feel accurate to them. So I don't, I, you know, I think just calling it history is, is unfair. You know, gender is already a social construct. So I just, think we should be really sensitive about this and just recognize when someone changes their name or changes sensitive information on their birth certificate, it just doesn't seem appropriate for us to go that deep into well, it. I, I, I think that there are, the Department of Health, I'm sure keeps statistics. So there's probably aggregate information that can be accessed without identifying information, but it would be just, the idea of opening it up to research is, <clears throat> um, I mean, I'm, I can legitimately be doing research for my, my uh, capstone project or yeah. um, something else and my thesis and get access to stuff that I really shouldn't have access to. And um, <clears throat> so I, and I, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think that's a problem. I think that the Department of Health deals with research all the time. Right. And they have a, a lens through which they look at it and, and the hoops that you have to jump through is, is serious research. I think that's, I think yeah. that is probably manageable. I, I just would, and maybe I just have to, I, I don't think there's any rush on this bill. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to feel pushed on this. And I actually think there are questions that we may have for David. Uh, so I, I just don't want to feel rushed on it. No, we can we can definitely have David come in. I and we should figure out what it is we want to ask him um, because uh, I uh, doing they they do the Department of Health does legitimate research all the time with HIPAA protected information by by using aggregate information. So, but there is help what specific information you might be interested in. But but we don't need to tell the department that they can they no. can do that research. And I don't think in here we need to say they can do that research. No, it's, I agree. It's um, mm -hmm. I thought I thought when you said open it up to research, you meant me I, I, going into research. So no, that's not research. Okay. That's an individual. I mean, that's no. I could be doing did research a, for a but a thesis. thesis if you did a state, a, a, a countrywide study on cancers uh, or different health outcomes that happen, you know, that are specific, uh, perhaps to people who've changed their gender. I mean, there may be issues, health issues that that may be very legitimate, and that the LGBTQ community wants to know. And the Department of Health can and, do that. And my question is, are they? Would they be able to do that? And would they be able to participate without the individual saying yes? Okay. So that's the kind of question I'm talking about. And this may be research. Okay. okay. Everyone wants to know the answers to. Okay. We'll we'll hear from David. My, my understanding is what we're doing here is we're giving them the power to adopt emergency rules, which is something pretty quick, followed by a full rulemaking process that takes longer. Yes. And it seems like some of these questions about whether it's open to researchers or not seem like the kind of questions that could be that could be raised in the rulemaking yes. process. So instead of us having to decide whether okay. it's and I can just ask them for those questions. Seems like right. that's a, that's a yeah. question for the rulemaking process. Brilliant. Phew. Good idea. That means you're serving on rules next time. <laughs> I don't know. I find that stuff kind of boring. Oh. <laughs> and they meet every Wednesday morning or every Thursday morning or some ridiculous mm. thing. So, okay. So we will schedule this again um, and have David come in. And I'd like I'd like to do it <clears throat> next week so that yeah. we can start um, 
So we'll schedule this for some time next week. Uh, I don't even know if we have anything scheduled for Thursday or Friday of this week. We have heard about it. It's on Friday. Friday. It's on Friday. We don't have anything scheduled on Thursday. Maybe he can, I'll call him and see if he can come in on Thursday. Right? Okay. Of course, that's when it comes to this. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Tucker. Thank you, Taylor, for moving on this. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for taking it up so quickly. <laughs> yes, well, I did. I promised that um, told Dan that she needed to get it, Representative Pugh, that she needed to get out quickly so we could take it up. <laughs> and she did. And she did. And I didn't even know.